Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. As voting continues in record numbers across our state, this week we're joined by two of my all-time favorite people. Katie Couric is one of the best-known, best-liked broadcasters in the history of TV. She's now a big star in the digital space as well. You can subscribe to her daily newsletter like I do. It's called Wake Up Call. You can find her videos, podcasts, and more at katiecouric.com. Brian Goldsmith is one of our most frequent guests here. You know him for his work with the Pete Buttigieg campaign, now as a Democratic strategist. But before that, he was the longtime producer for Katie Couric. Brian was by her side for all of the biggest political interviews and co-hosted the Katie Couric podcast. Brian and Katie, welcome to the issue. It's great to see you together again. Hi, Alex. It's great <laughs> it's to great be to here. It's great to be with my pal Katie, great although I'm always... Again. I'm nervous to be on TV with Katie. I feel like I can't measure up at all. Yeah, it, well, I mean, it, it is like playing basketball with uh, Michael Jordan or LeBron James. But here you go, Brian. I think you can do it. You're, you're the, the Scotty Pippen of this uh, show today. All right, let's start <laughs> broadly. Um, Katie, with, with the idea of, of where the campaign is at, where do you see things right now from a presidential perspective? And have you ever seen anything like this before in, in your years of broadcasting? I truly haven't, Alex. You know, I, I think it's been such an insane year and the campaign has been so insane. I do think the tide is turning, but of course we had it so wrong in 2016 where most people thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. I think you just can't take anything for granted. I think uh, Joe Biden is doing really well in some of these key battleground states, as Brian Pedia can probably report chapter and verse on in a second. But um, I really think that that as COVID rates spike in so many states and as the problem seems to grow worse and worse, juxtaposed with the images of President Trump taking off his mask uh, when he got to the White House, having these huge rallies, I think people are really starting to, in my view, have some buyer's remorse and some people who supported President Trump in 2016 are wondering if they really do want four more years of this kind of chaotic administration with so many mixed messages coming out of it. And Brian, where do you see things? I know you've spent a lot of your time, energy and money on the state of Florida trying to, to swing that state. Uh, I'm a little nervous, frankly. I, I think fundamentally Biden has an advantage in the race. The public thinks that the country's on the wrong track. On the other hand, I think there's a little irrational exuberance among some Democrats and on Twitter about just the extent of Biden's lead. Uh, we're seeing some uh, continued strength uh, behind Donald Trump among his core voter groups. Um, we're doing polling in Florida all the time, and it's a ferociously contested, very close race. So I think Democrats shouldn't take anything for granted. Uh, and one thing, Alex, I wanted to bring up, which is so interesting, I do think uh, an unforced error in the Biden campaign was their lack of outreach to Latino voters. Mm. I think that we're seeing in Florida and, and Brian's uh, surveys can probably bear this out, that President Trump does very well among Cubans. There is a generational difference between support among younger and older members of the Latino population. But it does feel as if uh, Joe Biden was a little asleep at the switch when it came to Latino voters. Would you say that's true, Brian? I would say there are two continued challenges in Florida for Joe Biden. One is, as you mentioned, the strength that Trump continues to have, especially with Cuban Americans, but not exclusively with Cuban Americans. And the Biden campaign recognizes the challenge and, and is rushing to try to fix it. Uh, you know, we've been there for a while trying to communicate the message about actually Trump's weakness against dictators and despots and socialists around the world. The second is on the economy. Uh, Trump's uh, kind of last vestige of real voter strength is the perception that he's a better economic manager. And I don't think that the Biden campaign is contesting that 
quite as vigorously as they ought to. And so we're trying to fill that in to make the case that actually Biden will do a better job for the middle class and to get the economy going again by, first of all, getting COVID under control. Katie, originally we, we booked you to talk about the presidential debate that was originally scheduled for this week. That ended up not happening. What we saw were these dueling town halls. First, ABC scheduling one with Joe Biden, then NBC scheduling one with Donald Trump. And I know you've been very vocal that you are not appreciative of that decision by NBC. Why? Well, first, let me say that I have many friends who still work at NBC, and some of my best years in television news took place at NBC. So. I have a lot of respect for my colleagues there who have been working so hard and doing a great job. Having said that, however, I was really disappointed by the decision by management to go head to head with a town hall uh, featuring former Vice President Biden. I think the fact that President Trump pulled out of a debate, he did not want to do a virtual debate. And then he, even on the campaign trail this week in North Carolina, was mocking the journalists at NBC and saying it was an hour of free airtime. I just really have a problem with the scheduling. I think it was really just craven and wrong, and they should have scheduled it on a night where, where Vice President Biden was not doing a town hall meeting, because you can see how it's going to play out. Uh, because many people believe that President Trump is good TV, he will say, my ratings were much better whether they were or not, but I imagine they probably will be. And then he's going to translate ratings into electability and somehow that Americans are much more interested in him than Joe Biden and ergo he should be reelected. So you can just see the whole the whole scenario being played out. And I just think it was a really, really bad decision. And as I said in my tweet, Alex, I think it's really bad for democracy. And now they're charging exorbitant ad rates for both town hall meetings. It just make, makes uh, the networks look like they are not performing a public service, but they're a purely for profit enterprise. And of course, that should probably not surprise anyone. But aren't they for profit en enterprises? Yeah, I mean, yes, but you would think that there are some instances where educating the American electorate and letting them ask a presidential candidate questions that, that, that they might carve that out. But unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. And a girl can dream, right? But um, I don't think that's that's part of the equation at this point. You know, Katie, while you were at NBC, you actually interviewed Donald Trump a lot because he was at The Apprentice then. You even dressed like him for Halloween one year. I know you went to his wedding. Um, I I'm curious, what is Donald Trump like behind the scenes? What was it like covering Donald Trump? Well, you know, I think that in New York, people sort of, uh, you know, didn't take him, oh my God, didn't take him too seriously. You know, he was responsible for a very successful television show on NBC. I think he learned how to, uh, you know, perform for the cameras, thanks to his years on The Apprentice. You know, I have to say, uh, Donald Trump had been very nice to me through the years. He. Um, you know, came to my colon cancer benefits. He sang a funny rendition of I I'll Take Manhattan, and they changed the words to I Own Manhattan. Um, and, you know, he was a very good sport. Uh, I remember once when my daughter, uh, right after my husband died and her dad died, she had a birthday party at Woolman Rink. He arranged to have it, you know, stay open for an additional half hour. There was some kind of problem there. So, you know, and I went to his wedding and he was he was always very kind. Now, it was obviously a relationship based on mutual, uh, I, uh, you know, it, it, it was to both of our advantages because I was anchoring the Today Show and he was getting publicity on the Today Show. So there was some kind of slightly transactional element to it. But he was really actually, you know, quite nice to me on several occasions. And... Uh, you know, I had hopes that the presidency would maybe bring out the best in him, you know, and uh, that that he would come through and and actually step up in a way. And I think, unfortunately, it's kind of brought out the worst in him and, and his personal qualities. And I think it's just um, fed all the wrong 
qualities that that he has and brought them to the forefront and some of his his nicer aspects and his generosity i think at least in the public sphere have receded brian you and katie you know both covered joe biden together during several interviews in different roles i'm, I'm wondering what he was like behind the scenes well, Brian, well you, you know want to talk <laughs> i was thinking about this uh right before the show because we did a series at cbs called primary questions in which we asked the same questions, Katie asked the same questions, to the top five Democratic and Republican candidates. And it was very clear who the top four were. And we were really wrestling with whether we should invite on Biden or Chris Dodd for the fifth slot. And thank God we invited Joe Biden, who later, of course, got picked by Barack Obama to be his running mate. And I remember, in contrast to the kind of front-running candidates who had big entourages and a kind of complicated operation. You know, we called one guy, Larry Rasky, um, who has since passed away, very nice guy, and he arranged the whole thing. We met Biden in a hotel room. I think it was just Biden and Larry. Uh, Biden was very warm and gregarious and couldn't have been an easier interview. And I think we both thought very fondly of him. At the same time, we thought, you know, he probably doesn't have a shot to, to actually win this thing. And then he ends up, of course, becoming the uh, vice presidential nominee. He ends up in a debate with the other vice presidential nominee, uh, who, of course, that was the interview you guys were best known for, the most famous political interview probably in recent American history, your interview with Sarah Palin. Let's take a look at some of that. And when it comes to establishing your worldview, I was curious, what newspapers and magazines did you regularly read before you were tapped for this to stay informed and to understand the I've world? read most of them, again, with a great appreciation for the press, for the media. But like what coming, ones specifically? I'm curious that you... Um, all of them, any of them that um, have, have been in front of me over all these years. Um, I have... I've always wondered this, Katie, when that happened, What's going through your mind? Well, I mean, just to give a quick backstory, you know, we had spent a couple of days with Governor Palin, and we had done some, uh, this video right here, this was outside the United Nations, and after she spent the day there, and then we spent time with her in Ohio on a campaign stop. Honestly, I think she was really tired of me. Um, that famous exchange was when we were just getting B-roll for people who are watching. We were just getting video of us walking and talking that we could use in voiceover for the segment. So when I asked her about, I was really curious to just, you know, she she felt so strongly in, uh, about her political ideology. I wanted to know what kind of informed that. And and what she read and 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 you know what she gleaned from different publications so i just thought it was strange that she didn't answer the question because that morning as brian will tell us we saw her reading the new york times on the campaign plane and the fact that she didn't say gosh i read uh i read uh, primarily alaska publications because first and foremost my responsibility is to the people in my state so I think it was just odd that she couldn't come up with a better answer, and I still don't know why she didn't. And what, Brian, what do you think? Why do you think she didn't answer that question? You know, I'm still not sure. I think maybe she was so overprogrammed at that point. She was getting so much advice, often conflicting advice, didn't want to make a wrong move, didn't want to say, oh, with the New York Times, because that's too left didn't want to say the Alaska newspapers because that would have been provincial or something. And so she just froze. But I mean, that was a spontaneous question on your part. As you said, we didn't think we were going to use any of that. And it just goes to show why Katie, and I, <laughs> I really mean this, is not just the best interviewer in broadcasting today. I really think she's the best interviewer in the history of television broadcasting because she has this amazing ability to come up with the question, the moment that will really reveal something new and fresh and important for viewers. And, and, and that interview was just sort of a series of moments uh, like that. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it, it's amazing 12 years later, people are still talking about it. It, it, it is amazing. And Brian. Yeah, Brian. 
<laughs> uh, Brian, I'm, I'm wondering from a political perspective, do you think that there would be a Donald Trump without a Sarah Palin? Well, she was the canary in the coal mine about the way the Republican Party was changing. It was striking for us on the campaign trail in 2008 to see John McCain often getting a polite, respectful reception and Sarah Palin being treated like a rock star. And it just, you know, it began to show us, I think, the power of that grievance message to the Republican base. And even though McCain, with the broader electorate, was a more popular figure, Palin was really beloved by Republican primary voters in a way that McCain never really was. And so there was a market for what Trump was selling, and, and 2008 kind of exposed that. Right. And, and Katie, I'm... I thought, Alex, I was just going to add one thing. I thought this, she really started to tap into the class resentment that Brian was referring to. I rewatched the interview recently, Alex, and I asked a question about why she didn't have a passport. That was something people on social media were curious about because I solicited questions from, uh, from Twitter uh, before I did the interview. And, you know, looking back on it, it sounded really like an elitist, snobby question to say, why don't you have a passport? You know, aren't you curious about the world? And I thought that was one instance when Sarah Palin answered that quite well. She said, I didn't come from a family where they gave me, you know, a trip abroad after I graduated from college. I had to work two jobs. And I think in that exchange, it sort of encapsulated and gave a preview of this sort of coastal elite message and educated uh, populace versus kind of scrappy blue collar families who really didn't have some of the privileges that they that 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 the you know that other people had. And I just in that exchange, I saw the seeds of that being sown. And isn't it amazing that a billionaire real estate uh, magnet who inherited a large fortune from his father and lives in Manhattan uh, has tapped into that so well um, as well? Yeah. <laughs> Katie, you know, <laughs> you, you a segment. Can I just jump in and say one quick thing, which is uh, to the extent your viewers are interested in this topic, two years ago, Katie and I put together a podcast documentary. Uh, for the 10th anniversary of the Palin interviews, and people can still access it at Katie Couric's uh, podcast. And, yeah. and I actually, you know, I think it's pretty good. I think it's really, really good. Honestly, really, really well done. Uh, Katie, you know, you've done it all. You've done podcasting, local TV, network TV, a syndicated talk show, digital shows, podcasts, now a newsletter, literally like every form of media in the last few decades, you've been there at the center of it. And I'm wondering now, um, as there's discussion and thought about sort of where we go, where do you see the future of media going? Gosh, that's such a, a, a great question, Alex, and I, I wish I knew the answer. I think, you know, I'm very dismayed about, oh, there I am as Peter Pan, <laughs> about how fragmented and bifurcated the media landscape is and how Americans can't agree on a, a set of facts and how that is really paralyzing civil discourse and and really coming up with with cogent solutions for some of the problems we're facing. I think if uh, you know President Trump has been a real boon to media companies everywhere because he is an entertainer. People like watching him. He's unpredictable. You know whether you call him uh, a train wreck or good television or someone who's super authentic, depending on your perspective. As Les Moonves said, he's bad for the country, but good for business. So I'm not sure the impact it will have if President Trump is not reelected. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, chaos, and he is definitely laying the groundwork for contesting the election. I just interviewed someone from the Brennan Center to make sure people knew that our elections, our, our, our election system is in fact safe and secure and that they can trust that their vote will be counted because he is delegitimizing that so much. But I think it's going to be, you know, someone said, I think it was Michael Che on SNL at the beginning of the Trump administration that he just wanted the news to be boring again. And I have a feeling 
that people will not, it will not be as much engagement through enragement. I think Fox News mm. will continue to thrive because they will have an enemy in Joe Biden, just as, as they had in Barack Obama. But for networks in general, I think, um, I think it will be a pretty precipitous drop in the ratings. But I'm curious what you all think. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we saw uh, during the Bush administration, MSNBC really found its voice in being against it. You saw Keith Olbermann, Rachel Maddow really finding their voices in opposition at the time. Brian, your thoughts? Well, I think it's going to be harder, obviously, for MSNBC and, and to a large extent CNN, which have kind of become the, the opposition party as much as the Democrats. They're going to have to figure out uh, kind of new raison d'etre, new identity. Uh, for Fox, I think it's pretty easy, as Katie said. Uh, but, you know, uh, going beyond cable news, which of course only represents a small percentage of, of where people get their information, I think there's got to be a big concerted effort to combat this choose your own adventure, choose your own facts style of getting information. We've got to somehow get back to agreeing on facts and disagreeing on opinion and policy and politics. Um, and maybe the, the subscription model, the kind of what's old is new again, the rise of people paying for high quality journalism um, is ultimately what saves uh, at least some of the press. Um, I think some of the uh, models that Katie's working with uh, around sponsored content are also very interesting. But um, clearly, there's going to be a reckoning if and when uh, Trump leaves the scene. Yeah. I, you know, I and I think the beauty to you, Alex, is, you know, you still have Facebook that is, you know, targeting people with information, feeding them what they think they want to see. That obviously creates a, a more intense and almost concrete echo chamber for news consumers. So I think that has to be settled too, because I think they're a huge part of the problem. And uh, my, uh, my cousin's wife was here and she said, you know, I'm ordering the Wall Street Journal. I'm getting the, the, the Wall Street Journal delivered to my house every morning because it's not necessarily ideologically aligned with my thoughts. But I want to see something that everyone is reading. I want to see the placement of the articles because that delivers an editorial message as well. And I don't want to just see the stuff that so that these social media platforms are feeding me. Right. I want to see the stuff that they don't think I want to see, but I want to see in order to get a different point of view. So I thought that was such an interesting observation. And of course, you can get a lot of points of view on the wake up call daily newsletter every day from Katie Couric as well. <laughs> All right, Katie, uh, b before we go, Brian is, is a regular around here. And I want you to give, give you a chance to inflate his ego even more than it already is. So he's talked about what he loves about you. What is it that you love so much about Brian? Well, first of all, uh, Brian is very modest, but um, I always tell the story about, I, I don't know if you know this, Alex, but when Brian was in high school, high school, he got grounded for sneaking out of his room to watch C-SPAN. <laughs> so that's the kind of super nerd that Brian is. But first of all, he's the most generous uh, colleague I've ever worked with. He is so smart, I would call him and get his perspective almost on almost any issue. He does have an encyclopedic knowledge of what is going on and a really huge reservoir of understanding political history as well. So he has this awesome perspective on all these topics. And, and also, he's just an incredibly nice person and a great human being. So um, I don't know if that's enough for your ego, Brian, but it's all <laughs> genuine. And I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I've been, it's been a real privilege for me to not only get to work with Brian, but actually uh, benefit from, from his wisdom that's far beyond his years. Brian? I, I, I just sat through my own eulogy or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> Katie, that was way too generous, uh, as always. Uh, thank you very much. And I know you. Okay. But he's really funny, too, right, Alex? Uh, yes, yeah. And I, I got to say, while we're doing these over-the-top tributes, um, I have to say, as a kid, Katie, I have a distinct memory of being about nine years old, watching the Today Show and thinking, that is what I want to do with my life. Um, you describe this as a little stalkerish, but 
when I came on with you. But this is uh, me coming to the Today Show and meeting you as a kid. And, and uh, of all broadcasters, I think I, I've sort of most looked up to your interview style, your ability to make people feel comfortable and to be real and to uh, tell the, the real story in the process. And I, I don't think I would be doing this without you. So I, I have so much appreciation for you. And to have you on this show is uh, such like an, a momentous and a, like an emotional thing for me. So thank well, you for so all that you've done. Well, thank you. And by the way, I like your red tropical shirt that you wore on the Today Show. Please <laughs> remove that picture because that's a terrible picture of me. We'll do another one, Alex. In the <laughs> I think you're doing a terrific job and it's been a real pleasure getting to know you primarily through through Brian and uh, and anyway, I've really enjoyed talking yeah. to you. So well, thank you. Well, we always like to play music on this show. So because you two are coming back together on this show for the first time in a long time, I picked out this oh, song no. for you. <laughs> This is the chance to dance it out, Katie. I had a very special all the time. <laughs> Katie Couric, Brian Goldsmith, reunited. Great to see you guys together. Special congressional debate when we come back.